Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Look what we've got. This is Audio Royalty. This is an Accuphase E202 integrated amplifier from 1974. Now, let's put that into perspective. This is the very first Accuphase integrated amplifier they ever made. So back in the day, Accuphase was known as Ken Kensonic Laboratories. It was actually founded by a couple of engineers from Kenwood and for a very long time was partially owned by Kenwood. And then the funny thing is, it was distributed here in the United States by TIAC. So a very odd bed bedfellows kind of thing. So Kensonic Laboratories is exactly what it sounds like. I mean, this thing is laboratory grade audio gear. It's remarkable. It is so many amazing features in it and on the back, so many amazing features. It's just something else. And so what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to obviously go over the front panel and I have got <laughs> the brochure, which has graphs and charts and everything in it, talking about its performance. And then a 17 page owner's manual going over all of the features and functions and all of the other stuff that's in this thing. And then we're going to open it up, take a look inside. But I, I apologize. I will be reading from the brochure because there's no way I can commit all this stuff to memory. There's just so much of it. I mean, it's almost like a laboratory manual for a piece of laboratory gear, which is kind of what this thing is. It's remarkable. And it is built like a tank. This thing weighs about as much as my Honda Accord. It's been a joy to have, though, and I've been listening to it for the last couple of days. And at the end, we'll get to, you know, kind of my review of the sound quality and all that other stuff. But this thing transcends anything that, you know, kind of normal stuff. It's just a remarkable piece. It really is. It's like finding the crown jewels kind of a thing. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pause. We're going to go and look at the front panel and then we're going to look at the back panel. And again, I apologize. I'm going to be reading from the brochure or the manual because there's just so much stuff and to kind of um, decipher what it is. You know, the loudness button isn't called the loudness button. It's called a compensation button. So we've got to go through all that. So give me a couple of minutes to reset and we'll come back and look at the front panel. Okay, here we are at the front on the front panel of the E202 and power on. And you have speaker selector. Now the weird thing about this is you can have three pairs of speakers, A, B, and C, or A plus B or A plus C, but you can't do B plus C. <laughs> I don't know why. Power meters, and then the meter range, minus 20 dB, minus 10 dB, zero dB, or off. Obviously headphones. Obviously tape two in those days, uh, you could, quarter inch uh, headphone jack or quarter inch jacks were very, very common uh, and not unusual. Now, what I'm gonna do is I have to get into the owner's manual to start deciphering what all of this stuff is, but bass and treble, balance, volume, and the volume feel is very, very nice and heavy. Tape copy, so you can tape from deck one to deck two or deck two to deck one. And then your tape monitor is your source. So tape one or tape two or source. Now, if you had a three head tape machine, you could listen to the, the tape as it was being recorded. And that's where you choose this. And then you have a mode button. So you have stereo, you have reverse, so it'll flip left and right. You have mono left plus right. You have right, which is just out of the right side, right, spe right speaker, sorry, would be the left and right signal or out of the left speaker would be the left and right signal. Very unusual. And then your input selector. So you have auxiliary two, auxiliary one, tuner, disc one, disc two, and disc one and disc two refer to turntables. And what do you see on the back? All the adjustments you have for the turntables. Now I'm going to zoom in on these buttons. And again, I've got to, <laughs> I've got to look in the manual to actually decipher what all of that means. So give me a moment to reset. Okay, here we are looking at those buttons. Now, obviously bass and treble on off. That's very simple. Compensation. Compensation is actually the loudness control. Now what it does, according to the manual, the compensator is interlocked with volume control and provides up to nine dB bass boost at 50 Hertz when the volume knob is adjusted to the 10 o'clock position. The compensator is automatically deactivated when the volume knob is set to the 12 o'clock or higher position, after which a flat frequency response characteristic is obtained, even though the switch may remain locked in. Isn't that hilarious? Now, this is low enhanced, but it's called disc low enhanced in the uh, owner's manual. So disc low enhance, low frequency enhancement switch. This switch is used to enhance low frequency sounds by slightly changing the characteristic of the equalizer enhancement of one dB against the RIAA curve at 100 hertz is obtained. I know this was translated from Japanese. 
When this switch is set to off, a true RIAA standard response is obtained. I just think that's hilarious as I'll get out. And obviously turntables were such a big deal in those days. So now we have subsonic and subsonic is not uncommon these days. It is obviously only on turntables. And what it is, according to this, when the switch is pushed and locked in, subsonic turn turntable vibrations, 25 Hertz or lower are filtered out completely. And then we have a, a low filter switch, which is kind of unusual that when that switch is locked in, it activates the low frequency filter designed to eliminate turntable rumble, etc. This filter provides an 18, excuse me, an 18 dB per octave cutoff below 30 Hertz. And then this is the high level switch. And this, when this switch is locked in, it activates a high frequency filter, which effectively cuts out high frequency noises, such as record scratches and FM interference of five kilohertz or higher at 12 dB per octave. I just think that's amazing. So this unit is just remarkable in the way it looks and performs. And I think, again, in, in the day, this truly was a laboratory grade amplifier. I mean, it really is like something else. And we'll talk about that a bit when we get into the sound quality. So anyway, what we're going to do is I'm going to spin it around. I'm sorry for the exposure. I had to move my lights. I'm going to spin this around and we're going to take a look at the back. <laughs> you won't believe the back of this thing. Give me a minute. All right, here's Thanks. part of the back panel of the uh, E202. And obviously you can see a regular high level inputs. These would, you know, tuner auxiliary, or whatever. You plug a CD player or, or something else into there. Tape one, tape two, pretty simple. But when we get to the turntables, it gets really interesting. So we have low level input one, low level input two. Now, low level input one, I can change the impedance to match the uh, cartridge. So a moving magnet would be 47k ohms. And obviously you can move up or down depending on if you have high level uh, moving coil or low level moving coil. But then you can adjust the individual channel balance individually on the back of the unit. I'm not sure that was really a needed thing. I don't know. You can't do it on the second turntable input. You're stuck with whatever you got there. That's really, really interesting. And then this gets really strange where it says, and I apologize, I have to read from the deck or the, read from the manual speaker damping. Now, the way this is explained is the control is ordinarily used in normal position, switching it to medium or soft position. However, changes the speaker damping factor respectively to five and one and causes a softer sound quality. Learn to make use of this control and enjoy the sound variation that it offers. They will make audiophiles appreciate their old favorites, in quotes, speakers even more because of different soothing sound that they may be able to get from them. I think that's just absolutely classic. It really is. Now, I'm going to move over just a little bit here. There we go. And then you have a pre and main out loop, which is really great because if you had EQs and so forth in the day, you could put it there and then you would, you know, this move this panel. It's got a lockout to go from, you know, normal to separate. And of course your voltage control. Now we're going to move over here. Look at the speaker terminals. They're screw terminals. I literally had to go out and buy little lug, little U terminals, little J terminals to fit in there and make it up off a pair of 16 gauge speaker wire, which I think is hilarious. Obviously circuit breaker reset. And then these are the great, you know, I miss these on current products. You know, you had switched outlets and unswitched outlets, plug your tape deck in, plug your tuner in. When you switch this on, switched everything else on. Or if you wanted something unswitched, like a turntable, whatever you could. Now, the cord has obviously been changed and made more modern. So that's that there. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to crack this bad boy open and we're going to take a look inside. I just think this thing is absolutely magnificent. I mean, it is truly a, a laboratory grade unit, which I just... I so admire. It's really, really neat. So give me a couple of minutes to reset. I'm not sure how the lighting will be, but we'll get a, a, take a deep look inside and have some fun with that. So I forgot to add this. Look at the, the back plate on this. It says integrated amplifier AccuFace, Ken Sonic Laboratory, made in Japan, distributed in the U.S. by TAC Corporation of America. And as I ever mentioned, Ken Sonic, Ken is Kenwood. They partially owned AccuFace Oh, I'm not sure up until when, but I'll do a little deep dive and in the summary we'll cover that. But I think that was fascinating and I forgot to add it and I wanted to. Hey everybody, we've got the top cover off and I'm not going to go any deeper than this. This is not my piece of equipment and uh, obviously it's quite valuable. You can see huge E-core e iron transformer, uh, 20,000 microfarads, 
of capacitance per channel. And I, these are look like replacement caps. So I think Kevin's probably had it redone. By the way, this unit belongs to uh, Kevin at Skylabs Audio in Des Moines, Iowa. What is difficult to see, and I'm going to try to, I apologize, I'm going to go handheld here for just one second to try and show you this. These are big TO3 case, uh, probably MOSFET power transistors, and there's two for each part of the sine wave per channel. So there's basically what was known as, a, I think, a Darlington pair. So you had two transistors to handle the, the positive waveform and two transistors to handle the negative waveform for both channels, so a total of eight output devices. These are the driver boards, and obviously preamp and everything lives up here, but if you looked inside, um, and it's a bit difficult to see, a lot of this is point-to-point uh, -point wiring. As a matter of fact, let me pause for a second and go handheld. Okay, as you can see along the back panel, this is all point-to-point hand-soldered wiring. Again, this is circa 1974, and you can see the layout is just beautiful. Look at the size of those heat sinks. And so you have your, your driver your driver boards, and then obviously preamp is under this shielded area. Because again, this was Kennesonic Laboratories. These guys were lab guys, and it really shows in this thing. And it's just a beast. It is really something else. So anyway, that's the look inside the uh, Accuphase E202. Again, from 1974, this is the second, or actually this is the very first integrated amplifier Accuphase ever made. So... Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the inside. I'll come back and we'll do a final summation on sound quality and all those other things. Thanks. Well, there you are, the Accuphase E202 integrated amplifier. What a beast. What a magnificently well-engineered, well-constructed piece of audio gear. I haven't seen anything like this in a great many years, other than some really, really high-end stuff. Um, this thing's just remarkable. All the quirks and features, like Doug DeMuro would say in his audio, in his auto reviews, the quirks and feature. Anyway, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you so much to Kevin Mall at Skylabs in Des Moines for loaning this to me and letting me play with it. Let's talk about the sound quality. Um, again, this is an Accuphase amp built by Ken Sonic Laboratories, which was their name until they finally changed the company name to Accuphase uh, completely. Um, it is a laboratory instrument. It's clinical. It is absolutely unforgiving. It is a microscope into whatever source you've got plugged into it. Good, bad, or otherwise, it is a microscope. It is not forgiving of poor recordings. Um, it is not forgiving of poor source. Um, and that's, but, I mean, it was built by lab guys. I mean, you know, engineers from Kenwood, funded by Kenwood. It was partially owned by Kenwood, uh, Accuphase was. And it was distributed in the U.S. by TIAC, like you saw in the back panel. So this thing is completely a laboratory instrument. It was designed around absolutely measuring perfectly. And the assumption being... If it measures perfectly, it's going to be completely transparent to the source. And it may be that. I found it to be, depending on the speaker combination, so let's go through that real quick. I had the monitor audio Silver 100s hooked up to it. A little bright. Um, actually, a lot bright. Not, not the best pairing. Um, then I hooked up the Braun uh, LC1003-8 uh, sealed box three-way little bookshelf speaker. And again... A, not, a, a little bit less bright, but being a small sealed box of the inch woofer, there wasn't a lot of bass. Um, and so just still a bit mid forward, I think is a characteristic of this. The little Warfies, the Diamond 8.2s, yeah, they do really well with just about anything. It's a very uh, gentle speaker. It, it uh, kind of brought the mid-range down, which just has a bit of prominence to my ear in the mid-range. And that was a really nice combination. When I hooked it up to my big Elax, that was an even better combination. Um, but still, this has, I think, a bright character. Now, it is rated at 100 watts by 2 into 8 ohms, 140 watts by 2 into 4 ohms, and 50 watts by 2 into 16 ohms, because that was a thing back in those days. But I also think, from a power standpoint, it could probably put out a, that 100 watts continuously. I don't know that it has, and I don't know that anything from this era, era has a lot of dynamic power. So typically, when we see an amplifier built like this, it's rated at 100 by 2 and 8 ohms. It would typically double its power into 4 ohms to go to 200. So I don't know that dynamic power was as big a design criteria as it became later in time. So this, I'm sure, just absolutely perfect at 100 watts, absolutely perfect from 20 to 20,000 hertz, but not a lot of dynamics. So 
it was a little thin in the base. Now, when I hooked up the subwoofer, it fleshed everything out. Um, and you could run the subwoofer. Mine has a has a, a line level loop, so you could put it between the pre out main in on this, and it would then cut uh, cross over this at whatever frequency I set on the back, so that this is only handling maybe 50 hertz and up, and then everything else is being handled by the amp and the subwoofer. But that really fleshed out the sound, and it made everything, all of the other speakers, sound better with it as well. But it is a little bit, I think, on its own, a little bit light and bass. And again, I think that's a dynamic power thing. I, I think, again, it's not a design flaw. I think it is just the design uh, or the criteria or the or the preferred uh, you know, design methodology of the day. Uh, and of course, component quality has improved and things like that. But it is just a magnificent beast. I've had so much fun with it. Um, it's really been enjoyable to have. And as you saw inside, it's just, it's built like, it's built like a piece of laboratory gear. And then with all of the manuals and graph charts and everything in it, even in the brochure, there's charts and graphs. Um, they obviously took this thing super seriously as a lab instrument. And I think that's really what it is. So anyway, it was a ton of fun to have. Um, I really enjoyed it. Again, thanks to Kevin uh, at Sky Labs in Des Moines for letting me borrow it. Really wonderful. So if you liked the video, I would appreciate a like. 80% um, of you guys who watch my videos aren't subscribed, and I would really appreciate it if you did. I mean, if I'm not doing what you want, unsubscribe. You can always take it back. That's not a big deal. Also, too, please comment. Any of you who have commented on my videos know that I read all the comments. I react to them, even if it's just a heart, but I'll always, usually always write something back to you, especially when you share your stories and your experiences. I love that part. Um, and I think as I would love to be able to feel like we have a bit of a community with like-minded people sharing their uh, experiences and sharing their, you know, their gear preferences and all that kind of stuff. Because nobody's right, nobody's wrong. That's the really good part about all of this. It's all subjective. And, you know, you can't argue with an opinion. You can debate, but you can't argue with an opinion. It's not right or wrong. It's an opinion. So anyway, like, subscribe, comment, all of those wonderful things. Disclosure, affiliate links in the description. If you buy something, I do receive a little tiny commission. Um, and... It doesn't affect your price, and it won't affect your ability to return the items. Um, there are playlists. Please look at the playlist. Let me know what you think of the playlist. If you've got a really cool playlist you created in Tidal, Cobuzz, or Spotify, share it with me in the comments, and I'll link it in the community page whenever we do that. So I'm going to have a maybe a community page with running playlists that you guys give to me that we add that everybody can experience and share, and, and that way we can all expose ourselves to new music because Nothing better than going down the rabbit hole chasing something interesting. You know, on title, if you like this band, you might like this band. I go down that rabbit hole all the time. So anyway, I'm done rambling on. I'm done going down the rabbit hole of my brain. Thank you guys so much for all your views. Thank you so much for your subscriptions. We just passed through 2,000 subscribers just a, a, a day or so ago. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm very humbled by that. I, it's, it's amazing to me that anybody wants to hear me talk. It really is. Most of the people in my life are sick of me talking because they've been hearing it forever. Anyway, thank you so very much. I appreciate you taking the time. This is Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, saying please go listen to some music. Please? Thanks. <laughs>